Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Tea Time. They have a special Star Wars mug with lightsabers. Check it out. If you want to go directly to my $1,000 mistake, you can go ahead and click in the description. There's probably going to be a link. There might be a link here or here. Who knows where the link will be, but please go ahead and follow it. Number two, can't stop, won't stop, won't be stopping doing content anytime soon. Don't worry about it. The stuff that's going to be told to you might be, oh my God, is it? No, it's not over. Everything's fine. Don't stress about a thing. Number three, thank you so much, so much to all uh, the patrons, the supporters. I got a new end screen going for all you guys. It's been something I mean to do for a long, long time. So really, really happy to be doing that. Okay. That stuff's out of the way. Let's get to the real deal. Why we're here. It's been a while, and this is why. So the last time we talked, it was machinima. It was all about machinima. I got a full-time job. I had kittens. Great. Still have kittens. Uh, you know, benefits. Cool. Awesome. And things were going pretty well. And then the last hours of the last day of Hork at the end of 2016, I think it was like the 19th of December or something like that, um, we, three of us, three of the six or so producers for the show got pulled into the office and they basically said, you don't have a job next year. And sort of that's kind of how things work, more or less. It's they wanted a two person show instead of a five person, six person show. And they picked two people, which were the hosts, Alex and Josh. And so they didn't really need us anymore. And so now it was sort of like, hmm, well, what, what do I do with my life? And two things happened. So at the moment where I realized, oh, I just got fired, more or less. We're going to use that term because it takes a long time to explain what happened. My contract didn't get renewed. We're just going to call it me getting fired. Um, so I got fired, and I felt good. And that's that's a weird thing, right? That's weird. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Uh, but the second thing that happened after the feeling good and feeling liberated and free and, all right, cool, I should have done this on my own a little while ago, uh, I realized a whole bunch of things at once. First procrastination is has been and continues to be and something I'm working on the root of all my problems I thought I started thinking about all the things that I wanted to do I started thinking about all the procrastinations that I had made while in LA while working for Machinima and thinking about all the things I could have done better in that small gap of time and just being a little frustrated at myself for procrastinating all of those things and missing opportunities. Incredibly frustrating. And it just sort of went back. And, and I think about all the things that I want to accomplish. So, all right, say I want to make uh, a video, you know, bam, procrastination shuts that down. Like anything that you or I or anybody wants to do, procrastination can kill it immediately. And so I've been really as sort of a New Year's resolution, as a sort of pivot point in my life, been trying to rid myself. We might get a whole episode on procrastination and, uh, you know, uh, my sort of struggle against it. And maybe, you know, you can get some help out of that. Maybe we'll make a tea time. Okay, moving on. Uh, I had made the mistake, second of all, the second realization I made, I made the mistake of thinking, oh, I'll have this job forever. Because for me, I've only had small jobs, right? I worked at Sears uh, selling electronics. I worked at Pizza Hut making pizzas, you know? And then eventually I went on 
my big job, which was esports. And that was all me. That was all, uh, I'm going to do this. This is what I want to do. And this is what I think is going to be successful. And there are their own unique stresses and, and struggles with being your own boss and working from home and things like that. And, and I dealt with those and I, I've, I've improved at those kind of things. But the, the other just main thing is sort of, I just have never been fired before. Never in, never have I, I've, I think I've had like six or seven jobs, but it's always just like, oh crap, Tom, you, you're, can you stay? You know, that was always the thing because I generally tend to be surrounded by people who don't work as hard as me. And so it's that little job security where it's, where it's nice. And I took that for granted in a major way. And so I was <laughs> buying things I didn't have money for. I was, I fell into this trap that so many people fall in and that I was guilty of judging other people for before until I experienced it myself. And I'm sure that you've judged people as well on something and then later on experienced it and then being like, oh my God, now that I've experienced, now I've felt the feelings, right? Sometimes you have to go through the process before you can really empathize um, or understand what someone's going through. And it's, it's just brutal. It's just absolutely brutal. It's so easy to, to, to fall off that just little slippery slope. All of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, it's just 10 bucks. Oh, it's just 15 bucks. Hey, we're all going out. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll go out. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I can afford to go out, of course, because I was making at Machinima way more than I've ever made on my own. Like uh, the, the best that I'd done before that was Tutorial Central. I was doing like, I don't know, uh, like 1500 a month and I was surviving off of that, which was like very, very bare bones. So this was the first time that I actually had disposable income in my life because like when I was living at home I was always saving up for stuff living on the edge I was going to school trying to pay for that trying to pay for books so I, I'd never been at a point before that in my life where I had disposable income and so I just I just thought that as this free like oh my god I can just buy stuff now and I just like thought oh I can buy this and I can buy this and you get a car and you get a car and I get it no, but I didn't get a car but thank god I did get two kittens which you know we're gonna get to in a bit uh, but <laughs> The point is that it, it was bad, right? I took for granted that I'd have that job as po uh, for my whole life, right? Like, until I didn't want it anymore. I thought it w I was in control when I wasn't. And uh, I didn't utilize any of the healthcare. I never, I went, I did not go, I had healthcare. And I didn't go to a single doctor's visit or a dentist. I have like two pairs of contacts left. I should have went to an eye doctor when it was all covered. And I'm under like the ACA now. So things are totally fine uh, unless Donald Trump takes away my health care, which would suck. But, you know, hopefully he won't. <sighs> um, <laughs> oh, Donald Trump. We're not going to get into that on this episode, but we will later on. Uh, but the other thing that I realized is that I wasn't happy. Which sounds entitled, and probably it is, you know, you think, oh man, so many people would kill to have the job that I had for those six months. Waking up every day, going into the into the studio at Machinima, recording some kind of an esports content show, something like that, and then going home. That was my job, and I was being paid well for it, and I was, you know, all these things. But I wasn't... I wasn't happy and things started well. I think that's the important part, right? I was very optimistic at the start. I was, and even during the very beginning, like the first month or two, a lot of fun. It was really great. It was really positive. I was learning a lot, growing a lot, all this kind of things. And then it just sort of, things got worse and worse and worse as time got on. And a big part of it was social anxiety. So <laughs> if you're going to move to LA, and you're going to, by the way, don't mind the creeks. I'm, uh, there are people up upstairs, nothing to be worried about. Um, <laughs> so I, if you're going to be in LA, you're going to be in the entertainment industry. Part of your job is going to gatherings of large groups of people and networking, which is the ugliest, nastiest word in my vocabulary that I, that I even know. I hate it. I don't like networking. I like talking to people, meeting people, things like that. That's a lot of fun. But going into a party or a, or a thing where I have to extract value out of other human beings, specifically strangers, it's sort of like it feels awful to me. And even just the simple fact of like being surrounded by people that I don't know, even if it's, you know, a group of 20 people or something like that, it personally just causes me tons and tons of uh, anxiety and stress and things like that. And to give you some perspective, we'll go back to the Atlanta, right? So Atlanta was 
we did Sacramento, Rhode Island, Atlanta, LA, back to Rhode Island. That's the process, right? So go back to Atlanta, my first night at Atlanta. All it was, it was, uh, Pol Pol wasn't even there yet. It was Violet and Andrew. And that was it. It was just two guys. I didn't know them, but I mean, Andrew was found my basically distress call on Twitter. And he said, well, you know, um, if, if there's some kind of a thing that you could do in esports, I got a, I got a place for you over here. Do you want to come and, and all that stuff? And it was great. And it was exciting. So he was being very generous. I knew that, or I at least thought that he had my best interest in mind. I trusted him. Um, but I spent the first night outside of the house, pacing around on the phone with my parents, venting my anxiety and just talking myself off a cliff, basically just being like really tense and just being like, okay, I need to, I need to vent, I need to talk, I need to, you know, get it. And you know, after, after a couple of days, things started getting comfortable and cool. And I wasn't as intimidated by Violet, even though he's this, you know, he's this really, you know, healthy guy and he's, and he's really smart and he's amazing at, at Starcraft and, and other games in general. And so like, you know, very impressive and, and Pult, same kind of a thing. So very sort of intimidating experience. And so I, I spent that whole first night, maybe like four or five hours on the phone with my parents uh, in the middle of the night, just walking back and forth uh, outside in the dark. <laughs> so that that was my reaction to two people. <laughs> then I went to L.A. <laughs> and the first night so i we we drive uh we drive we drove to uh to la from atlanta andrew and i did and we took turns and it was incredibly stressful and it took like i think three days or something like that three or four days um a lot of driving a lot of uh you know sleeping in the car and things like that and so we got there and i'm exhausted so i'm not even at a point where i'm it's probably smart to challenge myself socially. It's probably not a good move, but it was E3. We just arrived the night of E3 and the E3 after parties were all over the place. And Andrew is a super connected guy in the world of esports, And he was just like, I got you in. And so now I have a the, the, the pressure of like, I got you a spot in this party that you have to get a spot for. So you have to go. There's like obligation there, which was kind of good to challenge me. But I got there early. I got there. I went with Violet. And we got there like an hour before anybody else uh, got there that I knew. But there were, you know, hundreds of people in the building. There was music and dancing. It was a big, big party, right? It was this, in this big, like, uh, sort of place where it looks like you put on shows, right? Put on rock shows and things like that. And um, I, that was, oh, my God. I, re <laughs> I realized the extent of my social anxiety when that was happening because... I couldn't even deal with, I had to go to the bathroom. Not to go to the bathroom, but like lock myself up in a stall and sit down on the closed toilet that I'm not even going to bathroom on and just sitting there and opening my phone and staring at it and trying to distract myself from what was going on, building up the courage to be like, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna say hi to someone and I'm just gonna just be, I'm just gonna exist in this space without freaking out. And I couldn't do it. I like made, I even like, it was interesting. So I like walked around and I walked like I had a purpose, right? I love walking uh, like, uh, like, like I have a purpose because no one bothers me. Cause like, oh, that per that person over there, they are on the way to do something. They, I like to try to make myself as not approachable as possible. <laughs> Which is a terrible idea, right? It's but that's my natural state. I get very freaked out about that stuff, and uh, <laughs> so I was walking around, and I was I made a couple laps around, and and right over here is the dance floor, right? So I'm making my laps. And I'm just like, okay, these people will probably see me twice. I need to either commit and like try to do a dance and 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 start you know participating in the party in some way, or I need to jet. So I like walked onto the floor almost made i made eye contact with one person and that was it i just like instantly just panic all over my my face and my body and my, i felt it immediately and i was just like i gotta get out of here i felt this like fight or flight response and the flight was very strong and so i just had to get out of there i called an uber i'd only been there for an hour andrew and axel toss and all of them hadn't even showed up yet but i couldn't wait for him i i, I was at the point where it's just like i didn't have the willpower to wait, you know, another 15 minutes for them to show up. Um, and so, <laughs> 
we lead into machinima and we lead into working events. Initially, we didn't work events. Initially, it was go up, go to the studio, make some content, come back home and maybe some make, make some content at home. And the beginning was like 12 hour days and we're going to get to 12 hour days in a bit as well. Man, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in this episode. This is long. I'm, I, I apologize. It's going to be long. It's going to be rambly. I'm probably not even going to cut it because of the length. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully I get some memes or interesting things going on so you all, you all won't, you know, totally lose track of what's going on. But so we went to events. So the first event was Cod XP and we had the setup where it's sort of a desk outside. We had the two hosts, Alex and Josh, doing the host thing. And then me and other Alex were supposed to get like fan interviews and packages and these things. And um, so it was like really really stressful so not only was i in one of these situations again where i'm surrounded by people that i don't know i'm also i have tasks i have things to do specifically things that i am scared out of my mind to do like the simple idea of approaching a stranger and saying hi is like that's a challenge to me. It's something that I challenge myself to do, and sometimes I succeed, and sometimes I don't, and it's, I think it's a process. I don't think this is, like, a thing that I'm stuck with, or that most people are stuck with. This is a tendency that I have that I'm trying to break through, but it was, like, really, really hard, and we were working 12-hour days during the week, and then we added events, and what that did was basically made it so there were no days off, and we were working... 12 hours a day events would be sometimes 15 hours a day sometimes it was just you drive there you you work the whole time you drive back and you sleep and that was you know that was your weekend and then bam hey monday no no break happened do the monday thing again and so that became very stressful uh for for the the social reasons and also just for the the pure hours that are involved in that, in that whole kind of a thing and it's just whether it was the specific people that I happened to interact with, whether it was Machinima or LA or the entertainment industry, it's the way that people spoke and the way that people operated was a lot different than what I was used to. Any straightforwardness and directness was incredibly muted and softened. Uh, f- people were were everyone had secrets everyone was hiding things uh it was i can tell you this i have the secret information but i can't tell you because if i tell you then they'll know that i told you and then all this you know it's all this stuff no one's nothing's on the out on the table nothing's out in the open which is how i can operate the best i'm not particularly good at the whole reading between the lines and things which probably leads into the social anxiety etc but you know that's that's where it's at so the point is that I was going through this and it was really stressful, but the thing that kept me going, the thing that was pushing me forward since the beginning was doing it for the cause. You know, I was doing it for Starcraft, for esports, um, and I was doing it because I think it's important. I think that Starcraft is this incredible mental exercise that kids of all ages, assuming they can, you know, wield a mouse and keyboard reasonably should be participating in to develop their logical skills, to develop their critical thinking skills, creative problem solving, all of these things. And I, I really believe that. And that's kind of at the root of why I got into this in the first place. And what happened was it was it was so gradual that that sort of doing work that I thought was, you know, for the cause, that was that was significant and accomplishing something. It became less and less and less and less over time. It was so gradual. I didn't notice it until the BlizzCon finals. I didn't realize it until then because I was at BlizzCon and no one in the in the office was a Hearthstone person. And so I said, "Okay, I've played some Hearthstone. I know that Axel Toss and I both do StarCraft, so I'm going to pick up Hearthstone as a game. I'm going to grind it out, learn as much as I can about it so that way I can be the Hearthstone guy when we need one. Um, and at BlizzCon, we needed one. And Axel Toss was the StarCraft guy. And it was sort of, okay, I'm taking this hit. It's not what I want to do. But you know what? This is for this is for the good of the show. If the show does well, I believe in the show. The show is going to be great. Let's just, you know, I'll make these personal sacrifices for the show. And I was finally done with, or I thought I was done, with all of these uh, Hearthstone things. And I was like, okay, it's 
it's the finals. I didn't get to watch any of the rounds, but we were at the finals. Bion was playing, and I had been hyping up Bion, following the Bion storyline, just watching his play and just being amazed. I did some play breakdowns uh, for Machinima that were like, you know, just sort of marveling at what Bion can do. It's amazing. He, he's just a, a phenomenal player. And I just am a big fanboy, obviously, right? So I'm there. I watched the first game of the finals. I'm like, all right, cool. Woo. Okay. You know, it was it was sort of like, all right, I'm sitting down. I can I didn't get to watch any StarCraft or see any StarCraft anything, none of the StarCraft panels or anything like that. I literally had made a list in the beginning of BlizzCon. I was like, these are all the things that I'd really like to see that I'd like to cover. And I did none of those things and only the things that made me really stressed out that I didn't want to do. So finally at the end, we're at BlizzCon finals. I'm like all right, I'm going to watch Beyond Crush this nerd. <laughs> and he did, but I wasn't there to see it because second game, I got a text message that says, hey, we got an interview with a Hearthstone dev. We need you to come upstairs right now. And I was just, oh man, it was this dropping of all of the everything. It was just, <sighs> okay. You know, and, 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 you know, gather myself, go in. I'm on my phone immediately. I'm just like, OK, I what, what are the questions that I could ask a Hearthstone dev? Because we didn't get any planned interviews ahead of the time that we could prep for. It was just we were trying to get anything we could. So once we got all right, this is our only dev interview of the entire BlizzCon. We got to make a count. And I'm just sitting there looking up stuff. Like, right, What questions can I ask that this guy already hasn't been asked like a thousand times? And I hate giving interviews. Um, taking interviews like someone is going to interview me and ask me questions about myself that's easy i know all the answers but crafting questions in such a way to bring out like really good responses out of another person is something a i have very little practice in and b it's just it's very stressful for me it's not something that i enjoy doing at all and so <laughs> i get up there i do the i do the interview and um i i realized at that point in time that I was slowly getting pushed out of StarCraft and that I that it's been happening for quite some time and that at this point I had reached I thought about all the things that I had done the past two days uh, I don't think any of the footage that I shot actually made it into the episode maybe a very very small amount made it in but but that was about it I know specifically that that dev interview didn't make it anywhere. And so I missed the BlizzCon finals for nothing. But that's kind of the, the nature of the business. You get more footage than you need. You use the best footage and that's it. But oh, it just it felt terrible. And I was I just realized I spent my two favorite days of the year. And I've said that for every year that I've been to BlizzCon. So three years now, my two favorite days of the year being anxious, tired, scared, and just feeling all the stuff that I did that was insignificant, that it didn't matter. And that I, I just thought, you know, eventually it will get better. Eventually it will get better. Eventually we'll get better. I'm at BlizzCon finals and I was just thought, it's like, no, it's not going to get better. This is what it is. Th this is what's happening. And at the time I wasn't, I suppose, brave enough to decide okay, I'm going to make a giant shift. I'm going to leave Machinima. I'm going to leave this company and I'm going to go and do something else because this the work is not satisfying anymore. I don't think what I'm doing is significant. I don't think it matters. And uh, the other thing that was going on, right? So all, all of these stresses and all of these sort of, you know, moments getting pushed out of StarCraft, having the social anxiety. And the other thing that was always there and I think it's more of a more of a this than a this. It's more of a wait over time kind of a thing was homesickness and I'd been away from home for a total of I think four years at that point in time uh, I did have a six month stint in between Sacramento and Atlanta where I did live in Rhode Island and I was planning on staying but then I didn't stay and I left and it was brutal um, and so to sort of explain so that you understand where I'm coming from we have to go way back way way back in the life of Jack Attack before the idea of Jack Attack was even thought up or, or or conceived in any way at all. Before I was even Evil Archer on Warcraft 2, that was my ID. Before all that, my first memory, my very first memory, the, the furthest back that I can remember is watching my house 
through the back window of a vehicle, watching it shrink away and being told that that wasn't my home anymore. We were going to have a new home. And apparently, I don't remember the rest. I remember that part. Apparently, I was just awful with the new. I was like, I don't like this. This isn't my home. I would even apparently uh, (laughs) we would drive past because it was in the same city. We would drive past the old house and I would point at it as a three year old. That's my home. And so like this sort of. Uh, emotional trigger got built into my system very, very early on. And those are the stronger emotional triggers that are harder to change. And so being away from home was incredibly, incredibly uh, depressing for me, especially um, probably the the moment that I realized that how big the sacrifice that I had made was the first Christmas uh, after moving to Sacramento, after beginning, I was like 2012. Um, I Skyped in for Christmas and they put a laptop in the in the living room, you know, in Rhode Island, and I was, you know, in Sacramento on the other end, you know, with my computer, and they had shipped the presents they were getting me to me, and I held on to them and they were all wrapped. And we, we each took take turns opening presents. And, you know, after someone gives you a present, you know, you say thank you and usually hug them in, in my family, in my circle of people. You know, hugs. We're very huggy, physical, uh, kind of a family. And not having that. At that exact moment in time, like the first present when I realized, oh, I can't, I can't, hey, I'm telling a story here. I can't, um, I can't hug my parents right now or my brother or my sister. Like, and realizing that moment was just like, oh, and so, you know, I kept it up as well as I could and tried not to cry. But like, as soon as that Skype call was over, I was just like, you know, waterworks were open. I was, you know, a little pathetic jack attack on the bed, curled up into a little ball, just you know, considering whether or not I had made a mistake. And, uh, you know, eventually I got over it and said, you know, again, this is for the cause I'm doing, doing what I love. This is the sacrifice that has to be made for me to, for me to do what I love. And, um, so all this in mind, all these things, now you, you have the context. I felt happy when I got fired. Um, I felt relieved, uh, as well, right? Happy and relieved. And it was because I realized that this is a moment for me where I can pivot, where I can change things. I realized all of the stuff that, that I just talked about, all the all these things that were affecting me, I I was immediately clear on all of them. There they were. I was like, oh, this is why I feel like crap. It's like all of these things have been have been building up. And and I felt this really, really strong calling to go home. And I kind of always feel that way, but in these moments of where I'm allowed to pivot a bit, it was incredibly strong. And I, I just reached the point where I was I was done traveling. I was done being away from home. Um, I, <laughs> I even turned down a couple of jobs <laughs> because I said, I'm going to live in Rhode Island or very nearby. Uh, I will work from home. I will commute, but I'm not relocating for uh, for an esports job. Uh, and <laughs> And and that was that was a big deal, finally making that decision. So here I am, Uh, as you can see, I didn't expect to be exactly in the room that I grew up in. But here I am in the room that I grew up in. We now have we now have cats. We have the the cat tower. I heard the cats early. I don't know where they are right now. Uh, Icarus actually likes to climb climb into those uh, rafters over there. Um, But at this point, the uh, the strong calling to go home was there. I thought about it for a couple of days. And my flight was coming up. So I, I had made a flight uh, right after I got fired was Christmas vacation. And so I made a, a flight plan to, you know, go visit home on Christmas like I always did when I could afford it. And I had 36 hours. And I was like, 36 hours is just not enough time to pack. It will be incredibly stressful. And this is already a rough situation as it is. So, you know, what? so I'm going to plan another flight. We'll do it next week. That way I can ship all of my stuff over to Rhode Island and, and all of that stuff. And the main thing was, how am I going to get the cats from L.A. to Rhode Island? Like, how the hell do do you do that? And so the the main concerns are sort of like security. 
how do you get a cat through security in an airport? Uh, are they going to piss and shit all over the plane? Are they going to escape and piss and shit all over people? Uh, are they going to attack small children? Am I going to have a lawsuit filed against me by the airline? All of these, you know, ridiculous and, you know, somewhat reasonable things. Am I going to get kicked off the plane? Or, and, and this is the crazy part, this is, this is the, the cherry on top. Am I putting my cats through the exact experience that I had when I was three? Am I not taking them away from their home to a new home at a very young and impressionable age? <laughs> Am I like, you know, it's incredibly anal analogous to to that. And so considering, you know what, maybe I just give the cats back to the shelter or find them a new home or or something like that. Uh, do do I give them sedatives or not? How much is safe? How much is not safe? Do I need to see a vet? Do I need prescription stuff? Like, so all of these questions and all these stresses are going through my mind. And that was the whole week before the flight. I'm just packing things, shipping things, looking up stuff, trying to figure out how I'm going to get the cats over there. Uh, the carriers were a giant mess. Uh, carriers are OP. Cat carriers are uh, crap. Um... <laughs> The first carrier, this is, this is actually a, a little side story. So the first carrier came in and it was a Southwest one. And I thought to myself, they said two cats per carrier if they're small. And my cats were kittens. So I was like, those are small cats. And okay, I'll get the Southwest one. I'm flying Southwest. I'm going to get the Southwest cat carrier. So when I show up there, there's no way they're turning me away. There's no possible way they're going to be like, oh, uh, sorry, we're Southwest, uh, but we don't we don't take Southwest cat carriers. You have to do a, a third party cat carrier. You know, like that's not going to happen. So it's like, all right, well, cool. Ordered a week in advance and we're getting closer and closer to the flight. And I realize it's not showing up. We're two days before the flight and it's still not shown up. I think it was like three days past the day that it was going to say that it was going to show up. I paid extra to ship it as quickly as possible because I was under the gun and I wanted to be early and it still didn't show up. And so two days before I was like, I have Amazon Prime. I'm going to get the two day free shipping. I'm going to grab the cat carrier uh, from Amazon. Uh, that car cat carrier did come online, uh, <laughs> hopefully. And um, the cat carrier finally comes in. It's the day before the flight, and it's tiny. And yeah, I, I could have gotten the measuring tape out and considered, okay, this is this, this is that, you know, like, are they going to fit in? But I didn't, and the carrier arrived, uh, like you do, and I was just, crap, this is no good. The cats are going to be so stressed out in here. They are not going to be happy in the slightest, at all it's it's gonna be a disaster it's a disaster you know it's it's gonna be a disaster uh but you know what it's the night before the flight i know this is gonna suck i'm gonna piss people off on the plane i'm gonna make people feel uncomfortable and unhappy and that is just oh god i just everything in me wants to do the opposite of that all the time i hate hate disappointing people uh upsetting people and things like that and sometimes it's necessary and these are one of those times where it's like i'm really sorry but I just, I have to do this. And so it's night before the flight, 5 a.m. flight, keep that in mind. And I've spent the entire day shipping stuff. I had to go to a shipping place that was open until 11 p.m. to make sure I ship everything out. The last thing that I shipped was my computer and all right, here it goes, my computer, here you go, FedEx. Please send it safely. Don't break any parts because if I don't have this computer, I can't afford to buy another one or fix it. So please FedEx, uh, do all the extra packaging. This has to arrive safely. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna stay up. I'm gonna stay up, right? I'm gonna, it's a 5 a.m. flight. So that means I got to leave at two, get there at three and have two hours to go through security dollars because it's LAX. I've got two cats. I don't want any rushed feelings in my body at that point in time. And so I'm looking at the time and it's around it's around midnight. And I'm like, OK, I have two hours before I have to call the lift. Sleep cycle is 90 minutes. I think I can fit in one sleep cycle. I haven't slept in a while. I've been really stressed, so one sleep cycle would be really, really good. And I've occasionally done one sleep cycle, wake up, and it's incredibly refreshing and really effective, right? So, great. And I take my take my 90 minute nap, 
I set all the alarms. I do the trick where you put your phone in a cup to make and you pump the volume to make sure it's even louder, right? And I put it right on the side of my head, right? So there's like this much space between my ear and the super loud phone that's gonna go off and wake me up on time. All the precautions are are taken. And so I go to bed and I open my eyes. I instantly feel panic and then relief. It was so late that I didn't need to check the clock to know that I had missed my flight. Not only had I missed my flight, but the flight was like in Chicago at that point. The flight was gone. There, there was no like, oh, hey, maybe I can call and check. No, like it was over at that point in time. And uh, <laughs> so I checked the clock to make 100% sure because you want to check the clock, right? Uh, but I go back to sleep. I wake up to text messages from my family saying, hey, did you make your layover? Are you on the plane? How's things going? And I realize like, I've just put my family through all of this stress by not communicating to them while I'm traveling. And I'm sure that at this point they're like, oh, you know, is Tom okay? What's going on? My real name's Tom, just in case you didn't know. But in any case, they're, they're freaking out. And um, I just I just had to had to go back to sleep. Uh, I woke up, I called all of the family and the friends, and I'm like, I'm sorry that I they didn't text, and I'm also sorry because there's going to be a delay on me getting home again. <laughs> and um, so I booked the next flight, and now I'm thinking, okay, I know the size of the carrier, I want two carriers. Uh, I'm going to go to JetBlue instead, not because Southwest is bad. They're great. Like the prices are phenomenal. But JetBlue had a complete exact nonstop five and a half hour flight where the Southwest flight was like seven and a half hours. And and so like I'm gaining two hours. The flight was at 7 a.m. instead of 5 a.m. That's good. Uh, So it's going to be better for the cats. Also, because I had to buy a second seat. So two carriers underneath the two seats, two seats, had to buy both of them. And um so the the cats are there. I could bring both of my guitars. Right, that was the other part. I can bring both of my guitars because initially I'm not going to ship a guitar in a soft shell case because it's very likely it's going to be damaged and I just don't feel like going through the hassle of being like, oh, hey, you damaged my package. And they're like, oh, well, you didn't get insurance or you didn't do this special thing that you're supposed to do. And it was just like, I'm just going to leave the guitar. Someone in California wants a guitar. The yeah, Axel Toss will take it or give it to someone that he knows that wants one, whatever, you know, just give away. I did end up giving away a whole bunch of stuff um, that I just couldn't afford to ship. Right. And that's that's the deal. That's just sort of the way it was. And, um, but yeah, so <laughs> I imagine at this point you've realized that the cost of this flight was $1,000. And that was my $1,000 mistake. I missed uh, my alarms, all of them, every of the alarms, and it cost me $1,000. And that was brutal. Uh, but I was, you know, pretty quickly the, the relief set in where it was sort of like, okay, this is going to be better. I can get a better flight. All these, you know, better things can happen. And the main thing about it was I don't have a computer. I don't have any of my stuff. I have enough food in the kitchen to eat, but I pretty much have no, I'm not plugged in except for my phone. I'm not plugged in in any way at all. And so it was this sort of forced vacation where I couldn't really make progress on any of the things I needed to make progress on. I couldn't really accomplish things uh, that were, you know, necessary for me to take the next step, like getting healthcare in Rhode Island or getting my Rhode Island driver's license, all these different things that I have to take care of as, you know, when, when I'm moving. All this stuff is already done. So I got this really cool stress relieving vacation that I really, really needed. I just I just relaxed. I played with the cats. I ate and I worked out and I stretched and and things like that. And it was it was nice. It was it was nice. It was it was nice. And and things were just so much better set up for the second flight that I was looking forward to it a little bit more. I was like, okay, you know what? This isn't going to be so bad. Um, by the way, uh, a week later for flight number three, we're on flight number three. Now the week later, uh, the Southwest carrier showed up the cat carrier from Southwest, but the second carrier that I ordered from Amazon didn't show up, even though it was two day shipping and it took a week, nothing. I actually think that it still hasn't shown up in Silmar. I don't know why. At this point, I'm done with it and I don't care. But for some reason, cat carriers were ridiculous. And now 
I'm just like, okay, every single night I'm w I'm sleeping early, I'm going to bed early, and I'm waking up at the time that I need to wake up for the flight. So I've set the sleep schedule. I was used to waking up at the correct time, which I think was like 4 a.m. or something stupid. And um, I'm like, okay, we're okay. Night of the flight, night before the flight. Here we go. I wake up on time. Thank God, I wake up on time. Everything is okay. Get the cats in the carriers called Lyft and the cats are meowing. Louder than they've ever meowed the entire Lyft ride. I, you know, gave a really big tip to the Lyft driver. He was really understandable and really nice and understanding, excuse me. Under, he was understandable as well. I could understand what he was saying, but he was very understanding and, and kind. And so, you know, give him the biggest tip that I could possibly give him and thanked him a lot, got off and we walked into the airport and the cats just nothing just shut up and i was like okay okay here we go this could be okay this could be okay i'm not gonna allow myself to hope too much but this could be okay and um we go through security and this is the next sort of stress for me icarus who is a small black male cat does not like being picked up nova who is the large black and white female cat does like being picked up so i'm like okay when you go through security, I had red, you have to pick up the cat, walk through the thing, and then put them in the carrier. The carrier goes through the place that all the luggage goes through, right? It's the same kind of process. And I was thinking, well, I have two cats. This is going to be a disaster. This is going to be really hard to do, especially with Icarus. Well, he doesn't like being picked up. And I thought, okay, you know, they've both been really, really chill. And this is probably, you know, uh, stimuli overload, right? All this lights and sounds and people and, and things going on all around them and sort of Icarus got in his little comfy zone and I had to take him out of it and so the, the woman on side of me was like telling me and I was and I was just like please 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 whatever I read online just let it not be true let me just be able to keep them in the carriers and walk through or, or something like let me be able to do that please but no not possible the the lady says all right do you want to do hold both cats at the same time or do you, do you want to do one at a time and I thought okay you know I'll do both and then Two seconds later, I was like, wait, no, it's a terrible idea. One at a time. And Icarus is going first because this is going to be tough. And it was. He was like, oh, I feel so bad having to put him through this. He was like grabbing on to the edges and I had to forcibly pull him out. I had to grab his little paw and unlatch it, you know, from each side of the carrier. And and he was just like grabbing onto me and you know scratching me i'm sure i've got lots of scratches under here somewhere um and just not feeling good at all we walked through i was like got him back in the carrier close it up and i was like okay he went back to being quiet and chill and i was like okay we keep him in the carrier he feels safe here we're gonna be okay i don't have to take him out of the carrier again hopefully if he pees then i'm probably gonna have to take him out of the carrier or pull something out of the carrier and, and fix stuff right so we're good. Nova's fine. Nova goes through the whole process. She's like, this is great. I'm getting picked up. I'm getting some pets. This is cool. <laughs> and we get on the plane, watch some movies. Things are going good. We're flying out there. The guy on the side of me is like a 23 year old with a uh, psychology doctorate or something. And he's like super interesting. We talked the whole time and and, and just the fight, the flight just flew by. Right. And um, did not make, mean to make that horrible joke. I apologize. The flight just went by very quickly. And um, I look at the map and we're kind of sort of circling around Boston. If you've ever been on a flight before, a lot of times you get to your destination, you circle a little bit. You're either waiting in line, you're waiting for, you know, uh, a terminal to open up or what have you. And eventually you land. But we're we're up there for a while, we're up there for quite a while. And I'm just sort of thinking why are we what's going on it's been a, it's been like 15 20 minutes and usually you know five ten minutes maybe something like that it's like maybe a little longer and to, to put this in a little bit of perspective when we took off it was dark right it was dark when we took off so all of the windows every single window on the on the plane was closed and so we're circling around and i'm like i'm gonna open this window and i and i lift it up and it it, it looks like Someone taped a piece of white paper over the window on the outside. 
because white is literally all I can see. Apparently, there's a big snowstorm going on in Boston, uh, and not big for Boston. All you New Englanders who just got offended that I called it, a, you know, 11 inches of snow a big storm. Please calm down. I know that it's not a big storm. I've been here for a while, but <laughs> it's no visibility, like 15 feet of visibility. I think the pilot said when he came over on the on the intercom, and I'm just thinking, shit. I'm going to have to do everything again. They're going to have to land me somewhere else. And I'm going to have to either get a really long train ride or a car ride to get the rest of the way. Or I'm going to have to take another flight, take a hotel. It's uh, I think the way it works is weather is an act of God. So the the plane, the the airplane airlines are not responsible for refunding your ticket or, or things like that. And so that's going through my head, whether or not I knew it's true. Right. I'm stressing about that now. And I'm just sort of like, oh, God, it's going to be this is going to be a disaster. Um, And the plane lands and I'm like, oh, this pilot is a god. Thank you, based God pilot for landing this plane in no visibility and probably a lot of computer assist uh, and, you know, air traffic control assist and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, awesome. We land. We're safe. I'm on the ground in Rhode Island. I, I made it. I'm here. I just, it's done. And we're sort of taxiing for a while, like a half hour. And, uh, and the, the captain gets on and, and he's just sort of like, uh, the, uh, the gate in front of us is uh, experiencing some technical difficulties. Uh, and it's going to take about, you know, uh, 40, 45 minutes to fix. And I'm just sort of like, Okay, not only have we been taxiing forever, we just can't get to our gate because the plane that's on our gate is experiencing technical difficulties and we have to wait another 40 minutes. At this point, I've been traveling all day, so I'm just sort of like, what's another 40 minutes? No big deal, whatever. And 15 minutes go by. Another gate's opened up. It's like, okay, cool. We're going to go to the other gate. Nice. Okay. (sighs) There's snow on the connection of the jetway. The jetway is the thing that connects the terminal to the plane, right? And there's snow preventing the connection of the of the jetway. And so another 30 minutes go by, a flight attendant comes out. It's like, oh yeah, we're doing snow on the jetway and so blah, 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 blah. It's like, what the fuck? Does this, does this not ever end? Is this like some weird joke from some strange deity like that's like fucking with me right now? Like, is this actually happening? Um... <laughs> And uh, and finally, 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 the, the 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 jetway opens up, and they said, "All right, everyone, you know, we're we can get out, but there is some snow in the jetway where people walk, so please be careful. You know, take care of all your elderly and small children, you know, that kind of stuff." And uh, and I was just like walking through the jetway. There's like snow, kind of a little bit on the walls, all over the ground. That I'm feeling like Han Solo trying to escape Hoth. You know what I mean? I'm just like getting out of there, feeling like a badass. And I'm finally like, yeah, I achieved it. It's good. We get to baggage claim. I see my mom and dad who have been waiting this entire time. I think like it ended up being uh, three hours from the point where we landed to the point where I was actually seeing my parents it was something like that and it was and it was a five and a half hour flight so just put that into perspective and um it was it was it was so good it was so so good to like just see see their faces again and just be able to hug them and and see them and it was this amazing catharsis and it's like okay we're okay it's done it's not done and this is my last intercom impression i pressed and uh we have our baggage for the JetBlue flight A2A will be slightly delayed due to inclement weather. It's like, well, no shit. Now the baggage is being delayed. And so we wait around. The first bag, I think, came like an hour about after after I arrived there. So now we're grand total about four hours from landing to trying to get into my parents' vehicle with my stuff and go home. I live in... Uh, Rhode Island and we landed in Boston because Rhode Providence Airport doesn't have non-stops from LA and so now <laughs> finally the, my snowy guitar uh, <laughs> is uh, is you know is is out of there and and <laughs> I have my my baggage my, my two guitars we have the two cats and my mom and my dad is like okay finally we're here we're gonna leave and uh <laughs> 
then it's a snowstorm. So my mom, who does not enjoy driving in Boston, I mean, I think that's kind of a human being thing. If you ever dro- drove a vehicle, driven, if you have ever driven a vehicle in Boston, I think you can sort of relate. Nobody likes, dr- it's like, it's it's a nightmare. The traffic patterns are archaic and ridiculous because they're all built on these, you know, roads that were originally just like horse roads. And so, But anyway, uh, Boston's a nightmare to drive in. Uh, New Haven is also a nightmare for traffic and things like that. And so is LA. So ha, lots of traffic, lots of fun. And um, at, at this point, I was just, I was done. I, I had my stuff. I had my family. We could have been in that car driving home through the snowstorm for like five hours. It ended up being, I think, like one and a half hours, but it could have been forever. I I didn't care. I was done. I made it. I was home. I am home right now. I'm I'm home. And it's weird. It's very, very weird to say that Um, I don't think it's fully registered yet. that I'm I'm home and I it's not just a vacation. I'm not just here for a little bit and I got to squeeze in all my time with my friends and family and uh, you know anal retentive scheduling to make sure I get to see everybody before I go and just you know making a vacation very stressful. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's not I'm here. I'll be here tomorrow. I'll be here the next day and the next day and the next day, you know? And there's still a lot to do. There's still a lot of work to be done, but the fact that I don't have to deal with this weight of homesickness anymore, the fact that I don't have to, if I don't want to deal with the the incredible social anxiety type things uh, is great. It gives me this tons of energy. I'm just super, super excited about being better, right? It's it's about learning from, from this experience. And I, I just picked up so much perspective from that moment in time when, when I got fired. And I just, I feel like a different person. And I don't know if you've gone through this yet in your life, but I think we all sort of have moments in our life uh, where we make these really big personality shifts or these big revelatory moments. Um, Like I had this uh, professor in college named Leslie Bogad. If you're listening, what the hell? Thank you, but what the hell? What are you doing here? Tell me what's going on. But amazing professor, just super smart and being white, straight, middle class me, I going into college really didn't have a very strong understanding and empathy for uh, people uh, of color, people with people, women, people dealing with shit that I don't have to deal with. It was always just sort of like, oh, yeah, you have to deal with stuff and that sucks and I feel bad for you. Um, You know, that's rough. But in, in this situation, she showed me basically all of the ways that I was being a (laughs) douchebag that I didn't realize that I was, you know, that I was being a douchebag. All these things that I was saying that were racist or sexist or or messed up and they were hurting other people that I cared about around me and I had no idea. And so she was responsible for that really big, oh my God, I need to be aware of all of this stuff kind of things. And and me getting fired from Mission was a very similar experience where it was just sort of oh my God, I've been doing all these things wrong and I know exactly how to fix them and now I'm going to go fix them. And so, now what? So, this is the this is the informational part of the broadcast. The story part of the broadcast is now more or less over. Uh, I hope you enjoy the story part of the broadcast and uh, welcome to the informational part. Uh, so, moving forward, uh, I'm going to be moving into full-time software coding security area. Um, it's something that I'm teaching myself. It's something that I'm working on on my own. Uh, it's something that's sort of intuitive to me and that I like and that I enjoy. Uh, I can, sometimes I think I can understand, like, the way that computers think make more sense to me than the way that people think a lot of times. Uh, so for me, it's it's pretty cool. And it's something that I'm really excited in. I'm just, just getting cracking into. Uh, I'll probably have to get some temporary jobs, some entry-level jobs at, at companies and things like that. Uh, to sort of get in. Uh, There's a a particular uh, company that I'm gunning for that does a lot of uh, educational type stuff and certifications. Something like that would be really cool. And part-time, I'm going to do music, StarCraft, and Overwatch. Those three things. And that's what's going to be here. Music, StarCraft, and Overwatch. And obviously me telling you stories about stuff. We'll probably do more tour stories. Uh, 
I think that the first one didn't get a lot of views, but mostly because I haven't been making videos and I apologize for that. Things are gonna be more consistent uh, now that I'm not working 12 to 15 hours a day with no weekends, no breaks. Um, now that I'm doing that, we'll, uh, things will start to kick up again. Um, and uh, I've been sort of reluctant to bring music into this channel. I've done it a couple of times on pretty specific scenarios, but I'm going to make this place a place for my music and my poetry, as well as for my gaming stuff. And the reason why I haven't done that before is because I don't think it's particularly good for the channel. I don't think it's gonna be particularly successful or awesome uh, if I do that, but because I'm getting a job outside of the industry, I don't have to worry about that. It doesn't matter, success doesn't matter. I can just do things that I think are important, make content that I think matters, that's important, and not worry about all the other stuff. And it ends up being successful, great, that's cool. But if not, I there's no, there's no sort of stress involved in making sure I get enough views for the content and you know doing content that I don't wanna do because it gets the views, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, as far as, Esports stuff goes, the main thing that I'm gonna be focusing on is bronze science for StarCraft 2 and Broverwatch for Overwatch. I think it's kind of funny. Hopefully you like it. We're gonna have the first episode of Broverwatch. That'll be the next video I make after this one. So once this is done, I'll start figuring out how the, the video is gonna go and getting all the, the pictures and the memes together and such like that. Um, also, we'll continue to do tea times as we're doing now. And finally, uh, covers and originals. So I love music. I have a bachelor's degree. In music, I majored in voice, but I also play guitar, piano, drums, bass, and various other things at very, very mediocre levels. And so, uh, I'll be doing that. Maybe some acapella stuff, right? We can do the sort of, uh, you know, you, you, you split up the screen into squares and sing the different parts and things like that. I want to do that for a couple of things. I've been thinking about orchestrating uh, music parodies as well. It's kind of combines the gaming and the music, which are my two two big passions, which is cool. I'm going to try to do some more of that stuff. And, uh, you know, updating and improving these tutorials. So there are a bunch of tutorials over on Tutorial Central. Check them out, youtube.com slash tutorial central SC2. But some of them are kind of old and some of them are a little bit outdated and I don't have access to that channel and I don't make any money off of that channel anymore. And so I kind of want to just have all my videos on this channel. I wanna have all the work that I've done. I wanna have my whole body of work here on this channel. And to do that, I'm going to remaster, update, improve quality of most of the old tutorials uh, that I did. Like, I think the big one that I wanna do next for tutorials is how to wall. Um, and it may seem a little bit self-explanatory, but so many times uh, I watch, you know, bronze, uh, silver players, uh, sometimes even gold players that just don't know how to make a wall correctly. They can memorize, okay, I got the top ramp wall, but as soon as they get to the natural, they have to learn and stop and think and figure out, okay, memorize, this is how I'm going to make my wall and then move on because they, they don't really understand that the build grid is is designed to have a really specific set of rules and forms a really specific set of walls that certain units can get through and certain units can't. Sometimes it's a it's a totally full wall. Sometimes sm only small units can get through. Sometimes only medium units can get through. Knowing which units are medium, small, or large. Uh, they have specific numbers, like the size of a queen is 1.75, but the size of a roach is one, things like that. But as in terms of the game and things that matter, there are really three sizes, small, medium, and large. But in any case, that needs to be updated. There are new units involved, uh, things have changed, and I can do a lot better, higher quality audio fidelity, video fidelity, all that kind of stuff. So taking things like that, updating them, improving them, uh, working more on CSNStarcraft.com, which was a big thing when it came out. It was really exciting. It was pushing it really hard. But the problem was, again, profit, we, we weren't getting enough signups for lessons to continue working on the site. Uh, we dumped a lot of money into it and, and most of it's a loss, but the structure is there now. And so the only thing that's required for CSN StarCraft is for me and other people, if you're interested in helping with CSN StarCraft, send me an email at jacktacktv at gmail.com. But getting 
the curating the content, updating the content, bringing new videos, uh, thinking about ways to improve the site, all this kind of stuff. The developers are uh, for the site are amazing. They do everything on a volunteer basis and they're very talented and they put a lot of work into it. Um, so we have, we're really sort of lucky and in that way that we have that kind of support. Um, but if you want to help csnstarcraft.com in any way, please do. If you've never been there, please type it in your browser. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Give me all of your feedbacks. Um, but so that and then, of course, the core the staircase, the sandbox, um, et cetera, uh, is all going to happen. And so I haven't really made an Overwatch video yet, which is very intentional. Um, I am. I sort of jumped into StarCraft in a very aggressive and arrogant kind of a way. <laughs> the name for my first hotkey layout was the most efficient hotkey layout, uh, period. Like something like that. It was awful. I asked the Team Liquid Mods if I could change it uh, to the core instead, <laughs> uh, late, much later on. Uh, but I, I want to approach Overwatch in... Um, in a way where it's entertainment based. So I'll be doing the, the Brover watch initially and make the content more about me learning Overwatch and, and exploring the different heroes and what they can do and just being a beginner again, you know, which is a lot of fun. And I am very much an Overwatch beginner. I've never played before Overwatch a first person shooter on the computer. Uh, so just the, the idea of me using a mouse to aim in a three dimensional environment and, and trust me, the, the two dimensional environment of Starcraft mouse accuracy is just does not even apply to three dimensional environment of aiming at all. I know because I can be really, really accurate with my, my mouse when we're when I'm playing Starcraft, when we were playing Starcraft, you want to play Starcraft? We can. But when I'm playing Starcraft, when I'm playing Overwatch, it was just like just missing all over the place and never being able to hit anything. I've spent a lot of time uh, just playing custom games, practicing accuracy, doing all the different accuracy drills and things like that. But that's kind of what it, the Overwatch content is going to be about. It's going to be more about, you know, approaching it from a beginner. And then, of course, Bro Overwatch. It's been a lot of fun thinking about what is it? What would Brojack think about uh, Bastion? You know, would Brojack love Bastion or would he hate him? And making those decisions has been a lot of fun. I kind of went through and made a whole big document about the different uh, idiosyncrasies and characteristics that Brojack is going to have in. Uh, pertaining to overwatch different links that i can make uh over over things right like static d is a big recurring meme in the brojack world so uh bastion is going to be favored bastion's one of uh, one of brojack's favorites um <laughs> as you might imagine but yeah so it's, it's going to be a lot of fun uh it's going to be very very interesting and a lot of work and a lot of the hustle and a lot of new things but uh i'm here i've made it i'm home i'm actually home and now I can, I've basically done with, with eSports the same thing I did with music. So I went to school for music. I, I went on tour. Uh, I, I was a professional musician for a time. And then I realized all the cool things that I loved about music were like 1% of what I was doing. And at that point in time, it's like, I may as well be working a solid job that's stable, dependable, and has long-term security and doing this stuff for my enjoyment because that 1% isn't a whole lot of time. I can just do that when I'm not working. It's not necessary to do all this 99% of other stuff. <sighs> and so that's it. Uh, if you're still here, you're officially a hardcore member of the Jacket Pack. And I'm so glad to be able to keep you entertained for this long. So <laughs> let me know uh, how it's going. Actually, you know what? Uh, if you've made it this far, which you have because you are hearing me right now, uh, we're going to play a little game. Uh, think of something ridiculous, but somewhat plausible. We're going to troll everyone who doesn't watch the whole video. That's what we're going to do. Um, think of something ridiculous, but somewhat plausible that could possibly have happened during the video. Um, like the, the cat climbed on the ceiling or Jack Tack fell off his chair or, you know, what, whatever, uh, whatever thing you want to come up with. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we can get some creativity going. Uh, and then it, tell, tell everyone, put a comment in the YouTube channel, tell everyone that it happened at a particular timestamp and write the timestamp in. So they click it and they get there and then nothing happens. But I will know and you will know, we'll both know what exactly is going on. But so just again thank you so much anyone who've ever supported me even if this is the first video you're watching thank you for watching this video and, and being here and always letting me know what it is that you want to see and what it is you like or dislike about the content so that 
I can make content that I think is important and content that you like at the same time, because there's a lot of overlap in that Venn diagram. And that's where I want, want to kind of hang out. So please continue to give me the feedback. Let me know what's going on. And as always, my name is Jack Tech. Thank you for watching. If you have any ideas for a video you'd like me to do, please leave any questions, comments, criticisms, concerns, or anything beginning with letter C in the comment section below, and I'll see you again soon.